talking about the uh, UNAP strategy, for example, with uh, Bernadetta Odia. I met her yesterday, and she's the head of a commercial and institutional law practice and corporate legal advisor at UNAPS. And you're also a professor of procurement at the George Washington University and the co-writer of this book. So it's great to have you here today. And uh, the floor is yours for telling us more about the UNOPS initiatives and strategy. Thanks, everyone. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here uh, this afternoon. So I'm going to take a slightly different approach from the one that other uh, speakers um, took today. I would like all of you to look at things um, in perspective. And um, I really wanted to uh, talk about the several challenges that the world has today. Um, as you know, despite the significant progress that has been made in areas such as um, poverty reduction, life expectancy, and maternal health, there is still a significant gap um, which the 2030 Agenda for uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, aims to reduce. Um, the amount of official development assistance is not sufficient to cover the existing needs. Uh, the World Economic Forum estimated that in order to finance the SDGs, an investment of $2.5 trillion is required. Uh, blockchain offers an opportunity to improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, and the impact of development assistance. It, um, and the blockchain trust is not established by uh, governments, banks, or technology companies, but it's established through mass coordination and trust. Um, as um, some say, blockchain provides single source of, of trust, of truth, and ensures integrity and trust. Um, it allows anything of value to be moved uh, and stored uh, securely. So when, um, when I looked at the potential um, use that blockchain tools could have in the UN system, I really focused on two, um, two areas. Um, the potential use that uh, blockchain could have to address um, financial uh, challenges, and also the potential use that blockchain could have in order to build social and governance structures. So uh, let's think about uh, financial challenges. Today, uh, as you know, cross-border financial transactions represent the lifeblood of development work. And today what we see is that these transactions are expensive, um, they are um, sometimes, they involve a number of intermediaries and they certainly take too long. Um, blockchain can really um, um, foster financial in in um, in in uh, inclusion by providing access to the unbanked or underbanked people in the world. Um, I don't know how many of you know that more than 1.5 billion people in the world don't have access to the traditional banking uh, system. Uh, blockchain can also um, really make a change and reduce costs associated with de-risking. And so if we think about due diligence and KYC, you know your customer, um, often we see that the same um, exercises are conducted, data is not shared among various institutions, and again, funds are um, uh, wasted. They're wasted. Funds that could go to beneficiaries are instead being used to carry out the same processes that on, on the same institutions. Um, the, um, again, um, transparency. How have I forgotten transparency? Uh, blockchain can really help uh, comply with principles of transparency and accountability. More and more today, donors want to know where each of their taxpayers' money is going. 
They want to know exactly which beneficiaries are being reached through development assistance. And blockchain has the potential for giving that kind of information. So again, trying to track the each dollar that goes from the donor to, um, to the beneficiary. Um, and then finally, have you thought about the inefficiencies of multi-layered reporting uh, audits? Um, you know, again, costs that could certainly be um, be reduced. Now, looking at the uh, the use of the potential use of blockchain to address social and governance structures, just um, actually before. Um, I start talking about details in this area. I just wanted to focus again on two aspects relating to the financial uh, aspects. One that we looked at was uh, the ability, the possibility for us to even to receive funding in crypto and disburse funds in crypto. And again, um, as you know, we've talked about today, volatility is quite a big issue and consideration to keep in mind. Uh, but again, you know, there is an opportunity to allow for that uh, to happen. Uh, and in terms of disbursement of, uh, of funding, um, for instance, in the area of procurement, blockchain, again, has a huge potential because today we don't really know how much um, um, child labor, slavery, um, environmental destruction, uh, destruction and violence goes in all the products that we procure. So blockchain could really uh, make a difference because at each step of the value chain, it could certainly provide a um, certain level of information and again, increase transparency. Now, I've only been talking about um, the potential and of course the pros associated with the use of blockchain, but as every lawyer, I also have to look at what could possibly go wrong and what are the challenges associated with the use of blockchain. So, um, you know, some of these aspects have been mentioned by the other uh, panelists uh, today. I just wanted to mention really one, uh, since right now I was talking about procurement, for instance, you know, as we consider the possibility of dispersing funds in crypto, we could potentially limit competition, right? Only to those entities that are today are able to receive funds uh, in crypto. So again, a lot of you know good positive aspects, but there are also some considerations that need to be taken in into account. And in terms of you know the uh, again the value that blockchain could bring in social and governance areas. I wanted to just mention a couple in terms of, you know, identity management. Mariana and the others have spoken at length about uh, about this topic. But again, just to put things in perspective, let's remember that more than one million, one billion people in the world don't lack the most basic. Uh, human right, which is recognized identity. And again, this impacts every aspect of their life and certainly poses real dangers for the ones, uh, for the most vulnerable ones, children, migrants, and, uh, and women. Even then, though, we have seen that there are some uh, potentially uh, some privacy related concerns if data is shared across many access points. Um, Another aspect that I wanted to mention was the, um, uh, the possibility of uh, using blockchain uh, in the area of land uh, registration and uh, access to um, real property is certainly a key uh, aspect of development assistance and it is particularly important for UNOPS. I don't know if anybody has spoken about UNOPS so far. But uh, since we're here on, on this banner, perhaps I can just tell you that uh, UNOPS is unique in the UN system because it's the only organization that is entirely self-financed. It doesn't receive assessed uh, core uh, contributions. And its core mandate focuses on three areas, procurement, project management, and infrastructure. That's why uh, these aspects relating to 
procurement and infrastructure are so important to us and so uh, central to our, to our mandate. So now, for those of you who are in doubt as to whether a block-based land registry would be necessary, think about Haiti. When the disaster struck, most of the paper, actually all of the paper records were destroyed. And as of today, people are still fighting over whose land is whose. Again, we're going to talk about this with a different panel later this afternoon, and so we're going to look at, you know, more uh, at this in, in, in more detail. But again, there, there is huge potential for, for blockchain. Um, I don't want to take too much of everybody's time, so I think I'm going to conclude soon. Um, I just wanted to make a final remark to say that uh, technology by itself, um, technology can't work in isolation. Blockchain isn't a panacea. It's important that uh, whatever is put in place, uh, effective tools to address real challenges also work in tandem with more traditional mechanisms that seek to address some governance challenges, but also administrative uh, burdens, make sure that systems are integrated, um, and um, really it, 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 is, uh, it is important that um, all of these, all of these um, uh, tools, again, are, are, are uh, developed in coordination with, um, uh, with, with, with other existing measures, including capacity building, because we know that this can be a very complex Topics. So in some of the areas where we operate, this may not be so easy to understand uh, for ultimate beneficiaries and recipients. So um, again, thank you very much for everybody's uh, attention today. The UN is ready to innovate and change and all of this to um, improve the lives of those. <laughs>